What's up YouTube, Tom itself here. In this video, we're gonna go through an overview of the operator's primary guns, the assault rifles and carbines. First, we'll talk about the basic mechanics and stats of the guns in Battlefield, and then go over what makes each of the various operator's primary weapons unique in their own way. The simplified stats that you see in the gun selection screen are, well, they're fictional. Except for the rate of fire, those are correct actually. But the whole damage, accuracy, uh, range ratings, they're just made up. And what we actually want to look at are the raw stats. And for those numbers, we're going to go to a website called Simthic.com that, well, any nerdy Battlefield veteran is surely familiar with. And with that, I could end the commentary and just say go to Simthic.com because, well, all the information is there and they're going to update things with each patch. Their information will be more accurate and more up-to-date than anything I can do in a video. It'll also be more comprehensive. There are so many numbers for every gun and so many possible attachment combinations that attempting to cover them in a video simply does not make sense. Instead, I want to give an introduction to how these stats work, how they affect the guns, and what makes each of the guns somewhat unique. Because in general, you can just make a statement, they're trying to balance the different rates of fire, recoil, reload times, muzzle velocities, and all that good stuff in order to make each gun uh, viable in its own way. Right, there's a basic balance between high accuracy, high damage, and high rate of fire. So when looking at gun stats on the charts, the first couple are fairly easy to understand. Uh, rounds per minute, how fast the gun fires, pretty simple. Muzzle velocity, because rounds in Battlefield are treated as projectiles, they have to have a speed, so how fast the bullet travels. Note that adding a suppressor will decrease muzzle velocity. Then there's a drop. This is kind of weird because this normally bullet drop would be 9.8 meters per second. Battlefield uses a higher value uh, to make things feel like they're at a little longer range, make that bullet drop actually matter a little bit more than it would in real life at the given ranges. The assault rifles and carbines have 15 meters per second downward as opposed to 9.8 that you'd see in real life. And I think the sniper rifles tend to have 9.8 instead of 15. Then there's a time to live, how far the projectile can travel before it times out. This is a non-factor, don't worry about this. You're not going to be shooting assault rifles and carbines at ranges where that will matter. Next, fairly simple, magazine size and the empty and round left in the chamber reload speeds. Again, fairly straightforward, pretty easy to understand. But next, we get into recoil and accuracy numbers. And this is where things start to get tricky, both in terms of just understanding it and visualizing how it's going to affect the gun performance. Recoil is the stat that you're more familiar with because it's easy to see your gun kicking around on the screen and then eventually returning to its center position when you stop firing. Higher recoil values mean more recoil. Higher recoil recovery numbers mean your gun fights the effects of recoil more strongly and returns to center after you stop firing faster. And the last number we have is the first shot recoil multiplier. This is applied, well, every time you pull the trigger, you're going to get this multiplier on the recoil. Uh, just for one shot, however. So if you're in semi-auto mode, most guns have semi-auto mode, uh, that will come every time you pull the trigger, you'll get that extra recoil with that first shot. When you're on full auto mode, that'll come with the first shot in full auto mode. However, in burst mode, the first shot recoil multiplier is kind of a misnomer because it, the effects are applied after the last shot of the burst. More on that later in the video. But the hardest stat to visualize, the one that really trips new Battlefield players up, because you do not see this in Call of Duty, is spread. Now, you have spread fairly obviously when you're walking around and hip firing, but you have the same kind of random spread when you're aiming down sights. It's just that that spread is much less. However, it does increase as you move around, as you strafe while you're aiming down sights, and with each shot fired, that spread increases. And that spread is also affected by your stance. So there are a whole lot of numbers that go into governing this, and a lot of attachments deal with changing these spread numbers. While it's easy to look at a rounds per minute number and have just a little bit of testing, get a good idea for how fast that's going to feel like a gun is firing, it's also easy to look at a range on a map and have a rough idea for how far that is. Where in Battlefield, you've got all those objective markers that give you their current distance to them, and so with a little bit of practice and just paying a bit of attention, you'll get a good feel for how far distances are in-game. 
You can also understand how much damage a bullet does and to how long it's going to take to kill a guy. However, these recoil numbers are in degrees, and it's really hard to visualize what a tenth of a degree actually looks like in-game. And plus, with the random nature of those spreads, it's hard to know, did the bullet go fairly close to where the center of my point of aim was relative to how far it could have deviated? So let me give you some basic guidelines for trying to visualize how these degrees actually translate into distances or accuracy in-game. The most simple one I can come up with is that at 20 meters, a tenth of a degree is going to represent a deviation of 3.5 centimeters. With angles this small, we don't need to worry about the trig, you can just scale it right up. So the ACWR with a standing ADS spread of 0.5 degrees is going to be within 17.5 centimeters of its center point of aim on its first shot at 20 meters. At 40 meters, it's going to be twice that, or 35 centimeters. Now, it's a uniform distribution from the center, so half the rounds will be within half the possible distance from the center. But because it's an area, that means that half the rounds are in the middle quarter of the possible area of the spread. Alright, I'm getting a little technical, so let's keep moving. Next, let's talk about attachments. The basic descriptions given in-game are fairly reasonable, but they don't tell us exactly what numbers are going to be changed and how. We'll go over how things stand right now, but I have a feeling some of these might get significantly reworked later in the game's life. So, just like the gun stats, csimthic.com, they're going to have more up-to-date and comprehensive information. The compensator gives you less vertical recoil, but more side-to-side -side recoil and some other accuracy penalties. The heavy barrel's big thing is more accurate base ADS spread. There's also a little bit less recoil, but some penalties to accuracy while moving. The heavy barrel reduces vertical recoil about half as much as the compensator, but it also reduces side-to-side -side recoil where the compensator increases it. The muzzle brake has a similar vertical recoil reduction as the heavy barrel, but an even greater side-to-side uh, -side recoil reduction. The muzzle brake also increases the rate at which spread decreases, so when you stop shooting, you get back to your base accuracy faster. And of course, the flash hider is self-explanatory. The angled grip is a flat reduction of the first shot multiplier. The most important stat on the vertical grip is that it decreases the penalty to accuracy for moving while aiming down sights. The stock and the stubby grip do the same thing, mostly revolve around decreasing the per shot increase to spread. Alright, well that's all very well and good, but what should you run on any particular gun? And I find it generally comes down to how accurate do I need the gun to be. Another way of putting it is what range do I expect to use the gun at. And also deciding a reasonable approach to using the weapon. It's going to be semi-auto, burst fire, or longer bursts uh, of full automatic fire. If that answer includes possibly full auto, I have to worry, will that recoil make me miss? Especially with the first couple shots. Missing due to spread is certainly annoying, but you'll still hit some shots. Missing due to recoil means you're not going to hit any shots unless you can somehow get a control of that recoil, either by changing the weapon attachments or changing how you use the gun. With a controller in Battlefield, I am not a proponent of recoil compensation, pulling down on the thumbstick to try to counteract the recoil. I did a series of several videos mostly leading up to that point, so if you want more on that, I'll direct you to those videos. Instead of recoil compensation to control recoil, I suggest using either semi-auto or just burst fire. Slow that average rate of fire down as much as you have to in order to make sure shots hit. With all of that stuff out of the way, let's talk about some guns. In general, the operator's weapons are intended to be the most effective weapons in a specific range. That is, past PDW and shotgun range and full auto battle rifles, but still leave plenty of range for semi-auto battle rifles and sniper rifles and DMRs to have their place to shine. So when I compare the operator's weapons, I want to pick one as a baseline to compare the others against. To that end, what I give you is the G36C as the baseline operator weapon. 750 rounds per minute, medium accuracy, although it has extremely good hip fire accuracy. Other than that, it really doesn't stand out in any particular way. It's just a good all around gun. It shares its damage profile with several other operator primaries, and it's going to feel very similar to the assault rifles in Battlefield 3, which were 25 to 18.4 damage. 
But the more important difference between Battlefield 3 and Hardline in damage is where the maximum damage drop-off starts. In Battlefield 3, the damage drop-off started much closer to the player. In Hardline, it starts at 30 meters, and you can get 4-shot kills out to 30 meters. However, that assumes that you're not hitting any limbs, which could end up making it take one more shot to kill, or you're not getting headshots, which could potentially reduce the number of shots to kill. Headshots are a 2x multiplier. The SG-553 is extremely similar to the G36C. 50 rounds per minute is slower, but it ends up being slightly more accurate. It just has a slightly different recoil profile and spread. It's a pers matter of personal preference. I happen to like the SG-553 more, but it really doesn't make a big difference. The L85A2 is another very similar weapon. Just another 25 rounds per minute decrease, a damage drop-off that's 5 meters shorter, but otherwise just a reworked accuracy and recoil profile. What you'll mostly notice is the reduced first shot recoil multiplier. When combined with that lower rate of fire is going to make it feel more accurate. The SG-553 does have a higher first shot recoil multiplier, and so you might consider using the angled grip on it. But what all three of these weapons have in common, and is unique among them for the operator's primaries, is the option to burst fire. So here I am with an SG-553 with only an optical attachment, just spamming away in semi-auto mode, then switching over to the weapon's burst fire mode, which is a three-round burst. Then I'm going to try and burst it at three rounds uh, in full auto. I, I mess up a little bit. I shoot some four-round bursts here and there. And then we're going to go up to the wall and take a look and see how things turned out. Now keep in mind, we're still doing the weapon's maximum damage at this range, and if one of those hits is a headshot, it's a kill with just one burst. Now, I had some four round bursts with full auto, so I can't tell a big difference between the burst fire and full auto, though you can clearly see that recoil multiplier uh, really taking my shots up into the air uh, when I'm on semi-auto mode. Let's just stick a heavy barrel on and go back and redo those tests. Uh, semi-auto, well, the first shot's going to be more accurate, and it will drift upward more slowly because heavy barrel does reduce recoil, but it's still going to be inaccurate if I try to spam it in semi-auto. Burst firing is much more accurate, partly because I don't get that first shot recoil multiplier except on the last round of the burst. So when I go and try and burst fire in full auto mode just by using my trigger finger, uh, even though I, again, I screw up, I shoot some two and four round bursts, it's still not as accurate as when I had the weapon just in uh, burst fire mode. Now I'm standing still here, so I'm getting the maximum benefit of the heavy barrel. On Simthix charts, if you go to the advanced comparison, they will have accuracy plots for the first several shots of all the weapons, and you can select which weapon and which attachment you want, and you can compare the accuracy plots between them. However, they don't include uh, accuracy plots for burst firing at, say, different rates of burst firing, or uh, different rates of semi-auto fire. So you are unfortunately back to wall tests to try out different rates of fire, you know, how fast you pull the trigger in burst or semi-auto mode versus what attachments you want. Perhaps some enterprising individual work out some different plots, uh, some different recommendations to be made in general over how fast you want to fire the gun versus what attachments you want to have. Because right now, if you want to pull the trigger really fast, especially in burst fire mode, uh, kind of a question. Is angled grip or vertical grip a better option and for which weapons? And you know, how fast are we talking about pulling the trigger here? But right now, my impression is that slowly burst firing these weapons is the operator's best option for getting lots of damage downrange very precisely. They just also have the added benefit of being able to go into full auto mode and be quite respectable weapons at the closer ranges where full auto is an option. And it's not that I recommend uh, slapping a higher zoom scope on there and trying to fight at those longer ranges. It's just that when you find yourself in scenarios where you need to take headshots on a sniper who's behind cover mostly and has only got the top of his head showing, that is an option for those weapons. And you're going to take down that sniper very quickly, whereas other weapons you're going to have to go into semi-auto mode and it's going to take longer to get those shots on target. If you don't need the reduced spread of the heavy barrel, I don't think you need the reduced recoil from either the muzzle brake or the compensator. And so these weapons are also very good choices for suppressors. The CAR 556, 700 rounds per minute, but 10 extra rounds in the magazine. It has somewhat less recoil and a bit more accuracy than our G36C. However, the damage drop-off starts at only 8 meters. However, it ends at the same place as our other guns so far, and at the same amount. So that means it's going to typically take one more round to kill at medium ranges with the car. 
the ACWR, 800 rounds per minute, same damage profile as the L85A2, however its big downside is that 0.5 degrees base ADS spread. That means you probably want to run the heavy barrel on it, and under no circumstances should you run the compensator. It already has low vertical recoil, but lots of side-to-side -side recoil. The compensator is just gonna not do this gun any favors. The ACWR does have best-in-class reload times, which is something you'd look for if you wanted to push up, get a little closer with a gun. You know, you can't just duck behind cover or run away. You gotta be ready to return fire. But while you saw what the .3 ADS accuracy did with the uh, SG553 in those wall tests, and the ACWR is .5, Let's just say you're not going to be going for headshots at 40 meters without that heavy barrel. The ARM, with its 50 round mag, is a weapon that just begs for you to hold down the trigger. It shares the 25 damage at 25 meters damage model we've seen several times before. It has lower side to side recoil than the G36C, and it also has one of the lowest per shot spread increases of any of the operator's primary weapons. Like I said, it really just wants you to hold down that trigger. However, the base accuracy is the same as the G36C, so not amazing. And it also has a slightly higher first shot recoil multiplier, meaning you don't really want to just sit there and single shot with the thing. But all these benefits come with the downside. It has the slowest rate of fire of any of the operator's primaries at only 630 rounds per minute. In the end, I think my conclusion is that this weapon is a lot of fun because of that large magazine, but other weapons will outperform it, especially in any one-on-one -on -one gunfight. And almost anything you can do with this gun, you could do pretty much just as effectively with several of the other operator's primary weapons. I mean, it's good that finishing the Syndicate Challenge for the Operator doesn't suddenly give you some super overpowered gun, but if you were looking for an amazing reward for doing that stuff, grinding out those Rep 4 challenges, uh, you're going to be left wanting here. Now, onto the assault rifles, the M16 and the M416. These do 28 damage out to 40 meters. That is pretty scary for full auto weapons, shooting at 800 and 850 rounds per minute respectively. That 3 extra damage may not seem like a lot, but due to the way body multipliers work, you're hitting legs now, that's not going to increase the number of shots to kill. Actually, we don't have an exact breakdown on the numbers of body multipliers for the different weapon classes. I'm assuming it's the same as Battlefield 4 at this point. Now, these weapons do have more recoil than they did in the beta, and it can be hard to land uh, full auto shots on somebody. And so I find myself using heavy barrel, uh, muzzle brake, and sometimes the compensator. I mean, not only do they have quite a bit of recoil, but that first shot recoil multiplier, 2.5 and 2.2, uh, it's fairly high, especially the 2.5. In order to avoid the second and third rounds just going right over the guy's shoulder or head, I feel like I need to run the angled grip on these. And then I really have to burst fire the guns, even in full auto mode, in order to get multiple shots to land. If I hold the trigger down, I'm just going to end up mag dumping over a guy's head. While I certainly see the potential for these guns to be OP, they're not in my hands. I guess I just need to work with them some more. Maybe you can get it to work with some higher zoom optics, plus some cantered optics, and just switching between full auto and semi-auto mode, and then making it work at a variety of ranges. I mean, the threat here is the 4 hit kill at 800 or 850 rounds per minute out to 40 meters. I just find that I'm pretty unreliable at getting, well, more than 3 shots in a row to hit at anything more than 10 or 15 meters. The AKM is this weird bridge between the rest of the operator's guns, the assault rifles, and the battle rifles. It's a 3 to 5 hit kill. But where the battle rifles just have a lot of recoil, the AKM relies on a very high first shot multiplier in order to give it its recoil. So this is one case where the choice of what grip to run is very easy, I think. Run the angled grip. At that point, the AKM becomes a very flexible weapon, and your choice of barrels mostly depends on your playstyle and how you want to use the gun. Next, we have one of my favorite of the operator's weapons, the AKS-74U has very low recoil and lowest in class per shot spread increase. 28 damage up close at 735 rounds per minute. This gun is great. The downside is that damage drop off, dropping down to 14 damage at 32 meters. That's going to be normally an 8 hit kill at that point. This is our bridge towards the SMG category, or PDWs. Good close range damage with a sharp drop off at fairly close range, and without a lot of upwards recoil. It's just more accurate than the uh, SMGs are in general. 
As a result, I like to use it well in scenarios where I might otherwise use an SMG, fairly close range and typically with a suppressor. The slower travel time on the bullets is really a non-issue at the closer ranges I'm looking to use it at, but if I do need to try and push the range out a little bit, it's definitely got the accuracy to do that. While you can put a heavy barrel and vertical grip on this, uh, and a higher zoom optic, and it'll feel good in that it's not recoiling around all over the place, it's still going to take more hits to kill than most other guns at those ranges, and you'll still want to burst fire. I don't think I can recommend the 3.4 optic or any, anything higher on any of the operator's weapons. Maybe you can get away with it on the AKM when you're in semi-auto mode, but it doesn't seem like it's worth it for the rest of the guns. And finally, the RO933, the one everyone has unlocked by default. I think it's pretty bad, then that's clearly the consensus. I don't know what Visceral's thinking here. First, you've got worst in class damage at 20 down all the way to 12. Where every other gun has the possibility of a 4 hit kill with body shots, the RO933 does not. It also has a reasonable recoil, but then a 2.8 first shot recoil modifier. This means this is another weapon that I really think you want to be running the angled grip on, but you don't have that unlocked by default, so you have to put up with getting the kills with it in order to unlock that. That low per shot damage means you don't really want to take advantage of the low base ADS spread by just putting it in semi-auto and tapping away. No, it takes too many hits to get a kill like that, especially compared to the other operator options. Because of that lower damage, you've got less damage in each magazine, and so an extended mag might actually be a reasonable choice here. And I honestly blame some of Battlefield Hardline's trouble on them making this the starter weapon for the Operator class. It's fine that they've got a bad weapon in the game, but that they make people use it to start with is just going to make people really frustrated when they first get in the game and are trying to learn how to play. Alright, there's my basic overview of the Operator's primary weapons, and a few thoughts about how to use them and what they're best at. In a lot of cases, you really do have to go look at the hard stats in order to figure out what the difference is supposed to be. I assume there will be more game updates and balance changes, so check out Simthic.com to see what the stats are currently, and give a big thanks to the guys over there for all their hard work in putting these stats together.